Hi, I'm Unreal. Welcome to Plug and Play. In late 2016, Nintendo released a plug and play style system based on the NES, known as the NES Classic or NES Mini to some. It ended up selling decently enough, with plenty of copies still relatively easy to find nowadays. But honestly, as most people already know, the NES Classic was a huge hit. So much so that Nintendo could not keep up with the demand, making the system extremely hard to find. By April 2017, however, they ceased production on the NES Classic, so the only real way to get your hands on one after the production run ended was to either be extremely lucky or spend far more money than the system actually cost due to scumbag scalpers. And surprisingly enough, I didn't get one. You see, I personally didn't care enough to want an NES Classic at the time. I was more interested with what the Nintendo Switch was going to offer in those coming months. And by the time I actually wanted to get my hands on one, it was already far too late. Since the NES Classic was discontinued, many speculated that a similar style system would be done for the Super Nintendo. Those speculations turned out to be true, which brings us to the subject of today's plug and play video, the SNES Classic. Now for the record, even though I don't own an NES Classic, I am aware of the positives and the shortcomings that it had, so I'll be able to at least provide comparisons from that system to the SNES Classic here. With that all out of the way, let's see what the SNES Classic has to offer. The first thing to note is the relatively small size of the box, with the design of it nicely mimicking the original SNES packaging. The front of the box also lists off a few of the most notable titles from the system, such as Mario, Zelda, etc. Then we have the back of the box, showing off and listing all of the 21 games included in the SNES Classic, which is less than the 30 games that were included in the NES Classic. I've gotta say though, out of all the games featured on here, I already own a large majority of them. The only ones I don't own being Street Fighter 2, Final Fantasy 3, which is actually Final Fantasy 6, and Super Ghouls and Ghosts. I own Earthbound and Kirby Superstar on the Wii U and Wii Virtual Console respectively, and the rest of the games I own physically. So you may be asking, if I already own a large majority of the games that come with the SNES Classic, why did I still go out and buy one? See, that's the thing. I originally wasn't interested in picking one up when the SNES Classic rumors were still going around. But when Nintendo officially announced it, they threw in one hell of a reason to pick one up. What reason is that, you may ask? Star Fox 2! As you may already know, or saw in the box just a few moments ago, Nintendo decided to throw in the previously unreleased Star Fox 2 as a selling point. Now there has been a playable ROM of the beta floating around the internet for quite some time, hell I even played it myself a couple of times, but this is the first time Star Fox 2 has been officially finished and legally released in any form, nearly a decade after the game was cancelled in favor of Star Fox 64. It's just so crazy to me that we live in a timeline where Star Fox 2 actually came out and had a real release. Sorry, got a little sidetracked. Now let's get back to the system. Opening up the box, we're greeted with the standard warranty papers as well as the easy to follow setup instructions. The instructions also double as a small poster that looks like an old SNES ad featuring some of the games on the classic, which is pretty neat. The package comes with the SNES Classic, two SNES styled controllers, an HDMI cable, a micro USB cable, and a USB AC adapter. Just like the NES Classic, the SNES Classic is really small and can easily fit into your hand. Even the side of the package demonstrates this. Putting it next to my own Super Nintendo really does show how small it is in comparison to the original. And thankfully, the Classic doesn't have the yellow stains my real SNES has. Both the power button and the reset button feel accurate to the original, although the cartridge cover and eject button don't move or do anything. Those are simply there just for show. The controller ports shown also don't have a real function either, but they instead serve as a flap that protects the real controller ports. My only problem with this cover is that it feels like it could be easy to break when putting the flap back on, which causes me to be extra careful when trying to do so. Setting the SNES Classic itself up is really straightforward. 
Just plug in the HDMI cable to your TV and system, plug in the USB cable to the system into any powered USB port, or use the provided USB AC adapter, plug in your controllers, power the system on, and you're good to go. I really do like that the system is powered by USB, since it provides a lot of options to send power to the system. You can use the USB port on your TV, provided yours has one to begin with. Even the included instructions show this as an example. Your PC, or even modern game consoles, provided that they are powered on. So yes, that does mean you can power your SNES Classic using your PS4 or Xbox. I personally use the USB port on my TV since it's much easier to plug into with my current room setup than anything else. As mentioned earlier, the SNES Classic comes with two controllers, which is an improvement over the NES Classic, which only came with one. The controllers both look and feel fantastic, I feel they nailed the design of the originals as well as the overall comfort and feel. One thing I did notice comparing these controllers to my original ones was that the L and R buttons on my real ones had the letters colored in while the classic versions were etched in instead. Maybe my old ones were either a revision or were an earlier model. I don't know, it's just something I noticed, that's all. One thing the controller for the NES Classic was originally criticized for was the really short cord length, which made it really hard to play a fair distance away from the system, and in turn, the TV. Thankfully, the cord length for these controllers is now 5 feet instead of the 2.5 to 3 feet the NES one had, which helps make distant couch play a little more manageable. Whether or not it's a good enough improvement may vary from person to person, however. Depending on your room or gaming setup, the cord length could either be just fine or still not good enough. If you happen to own a really long HDMI cable, don't be afraid to use that if the distance does end up being an issue with the included one. Personally, the cord length for my setup is just fine, but again, your mileage may vary, so keep that in mind. One last thing I want to talk about with the controllers is compatibility. Just like the NES Classic controller, these controllers use the same plugin as the Wii Classic controller, which means you can plug it into your Wii remote and use it as a controller on the Wii or Wii U Virtual Console. The controllers work perfectly here, as I had no issue using them to play the SNES Virtual Console games I own. NES and Genesis games also worked well with the controller, but N64 did not work at all. Obviously, this is due to the lack of an analog stick. Just keep in mind that you can't navigate the original Wii menus properly with just the SNES controller. You still have to use a Wii remote or classic controller analog stick to do so. However, the Wii U menus work just fine. Speaking of which, you can in fact use a Wii Classic Controller or Classic Controller Pro on the SNES Classic. The controller works just as well here, just don't expect to be able to use the analog sticks or the Z buttons during any of the games. While it is cool that you can do this, I don't recommend it since the Wii Classic controller cord length isn't nearly long enough for practical use, especially since the system already comes with the preferred controllers and cord length anyway. There is one tiny benefit to using a Wii Classic controller, but I'll get to that later on in the video. Now since I don't have an NES Classic or one of its controllers, I can't say if the NES controllers would work on the SNES Classic, but based on my Wii testing, I assume the SNES controllers work well on the NES Classic. I highly doubt the NES controller would function well with the games included with the SNES Classic, however, except for maybe Super Ghouls and Ghosts, since that game only really uses two buttons in the D-pad. I'm sure someone out there has tested this out, so the info may already be out there if you are interested. So the presentation and the portability of the system is great, and the controllers feel solid and improve on the shortcomings the NES Classic controller had, but what about what this thing has to offer on the inside? Well, let's dive in and take a look. It's not plugged in. Right off the bat, you'll be greeted with the main menu and all 21 games at your disposal. I really love the look of this menu. It's easy to navigate and follow, and it's accompanied by a catchy theme that almost sounds like it can pass as a remix for the Wii Shop channel. The menu setup is similar to that of the NES Classic, outside of the visual style to match the appropriate system. So if you manage to get your hands on one of those, you'll be right at home with this one. Starting with the display options, you can choose to play in 4x3, which is the default, have a CRT filter added on, or play in pixel perfect mode. 4x3 is self-explanatory and looks accurate to how the games were originally displayed, but I was quite surprised at how decent the CRT filter was. 
Most CRT filters I've seen don't end up looking that good, but I feel that the filter here is one of the better ones out there. It may not look great on the recordings, but it looks far better on an actual TV. I don't use this filter too often though, as it's only really a novelty option for me personally. What I do use more often is the Pixel Perfect option, which makes the game's pixels be displayed as perfect squares instead of how they are displayed in 4x3. You can see a noticeable difference here with Super Metroid, and it's my personal favorite display option on the system. Which display is the overall best, however? That's really up to personal preference, as I don't mind using any of them, to be honest. I will say, filters or not, the games all look great on the SNES Classic. It really benefits from the HDMI. What is new to the SNES Classic are border frames. You can choose up to 11 different frames to display while playing any of the games. Again, these are just novelty options and are just here for fun, kind of like the frames featured in the Game Boy Player. I do really like some of them though, such as the Galaxy frame which goes really well with the more futuristic games in the collection, and this 80 styles grid frame which reminds me of a Treehouse of Horror episode when it turns green. Man, this place looks expensive. I feel like I'm wasting a fortune just standing here. There's also an option to reduce screen burn-in, as well as the My Gameplay demo, which automatically plays a recorded save state as a demo if you leave the console alone for some time. After about a minute of inactivity, Mario will come out and take over, selecting which demo to play. As you can see here, he selected the final boss of Super Ghouls and Ghosts, and the credits to Super Metroid. Not the best choices for a demo, Mario. If you don't have any save states, there is the generic demo option that works the same way. It's a neat feature, but it's only noticeable if you decide to keep the system running instead of actually playing it. Might be interesting at parties, though. Aside from the language options and the obligatory legal notices, you can select the manuals option to check out each of the instruction books for the included games. However, they aren't actually included with the system, as you have to scan the QR code using a smartphone or go to the website on your PC to check out the PDFs. It's a shame they aren't on the SNES Classic itself, but it isn't that big of a deal, as I was easily able to download the PDF files for the manuals from the website. The manuals themselves are in fact the exact manuals that came with each game, and in Earthbound's case, it's the giant guidebook that originally came with the game, which is really awesome. So there's only one real question left. How are the games? Is it a good selection? Yeah, I believe so. I'd even say it's a fantastic selection. Just don't expect me to cover every single game featured, because let's face it, we'd be here forever if I did that. While there may be less total games compared to the NES Classic, the SNES Classic has a really strong selection of games. There are so many standout titles included on the Classic that it's really hard to single one out as bad. It's pretty clear that nearly every game on here is some of the best the SNES has to offer, and they are easily worth playing. There are, of course, notable omissions from the collection such as Chrono Trigger and Turtles in Time, the latter of which most likely not make it on the list due to the licensing issues. Part of me wishes they could have had more than 21 games, that way Chrono Trigger would have had a bigger shot of making it in. Personally, if they had to only have 21 games included, I probably would have swapped in Chrono Trigger in place of either Kirby's Dream Course or Super Punch-Out. Nothing against those games at all, those are just the ones I personally would likely swap out over the others. Also, they totally should have chosen DKC2 over DKC1. The variety of genres across all these games is pretty good as well. F-Zero and Mario Kart covers racing, Street Fighter for fighting, Punch-Out and even Kirby of all things for sports, with RPGs, action games, and platformers being the most dominant in the collection. No real puzzle games are included though, which is odd. Swapping between games is also very easy as well. If you're in the middle of a game and want to play something else, just hit the reset button on the console and you'll be back to the game selection screen. And if you want, you can sort the order of the games via title, developer, number of players, year released, etc. It's a neat little addition if you're interested about that kind of stuff. A good number of games here support two players as well, with each game labeled appropriately to indicate it. This makes the fact that the SNES Classic being packaged with two controllers is a huge improvement over the NES Classic, which only came with one. Did you know that Final Fantasy VI had support for two players? I sure as hell didn't. 
While we're on that note, because the SNES Classic doesn't have a multi-tap or support for one, the three-player mode for Secret of Mana unfortunately does not work here. In terms of playability, I feel that each game controlled and responded very well. One issue that many people had with the NES Classic was the noticeable input lag. From what I've played with the SNES Classic, however, it seems that Nintendo fixed this issue, as I didn't notice any real input lag with the games. The only exception to this was Star Fox 2, but that was mainly due to that particular game's performance and frame rate. I personally didn't have any issues overall, and that's with my TV's game mode turned off. But if you do notice some slight input lag, try turning that option on your own TV and see if that does anything to help. Audio-wise, everything here sounds great as well. It sounds relatively accurate to the original titles in terms of sound effects and music. Speaking of which, it also helps that nearly all of the games included in the SNES Classic have amazing soundtracks. Easily some of the best not only on the SNES, but some of the best ever made. And finally, the last feature that carried over from the NES Classic is the ability to create save states. Each game has four suspend point slots that you can use, with the ability to lock the save states so you won't accidentally delete them. The system does warn you that saving your game from inside a save state will overwrite a current non-suspend point save, which only applies to the titles that have the ability to save progress. It's not that big of a deal, but it is something you should be aware of. In addition to bringing save states back, there is a brand new rewind feature, which allows you to rewind a set amount of time depending on the game, and start again from your spot of choice in case you mess up. I really like this feature, as it can be really helpful to players to go back and retry things without having to strictly adhere to the save states. I am pretty sure this feature was added in specifically because Contra 3 and Super Ghouls and Ghosts are a part of the game selection here, because man, both of those games are extremely tough. The only issue I find with the rewind and save state features is that in order to use them, you have to go up to the system and hit the reset button to bring up the main menu and use them from there. This again depends on your room setup, but if you're a decent ways away from the system, this can become a hassle. So if you happen to be playing Super Ghouls and Ghosts, prepare to hit that reset button more than 50 times, because I sure as hell did when I played that game. Remember that extra benefit I mentioned with the Wii Classic Controller earlier in the video? Turns out you can use the home button on the Classic Controller to go back to the main menu. It's convenient, but again due to the small core length that Classic Controllers have, it isn't the most practical solution either. Before I wrap up, while I did say I won't cover every game, I do want to very briefly talk about Star Fox 2, as it was the reason that made me want to buy an SNES Classic. Not a full review or anything, just some quick thoughts. I think it's safe to say Star Fox 2 was a huge selling point for most people to grab an SNES Classic, myself included. Playing this version after playing the leaked beta ROM was really cool, especially noticing all the changes that were made to the final product. While I personally do like this game quite a bit, it's really clear that this game was a little too ambitious, pushing the SNES to its limit. The ideas and concepts included in this game are awesome, but because of the limitations of the SNES, even with the Super FX chip, playability can get a little rough. As a side note, you can't immediately play this game when you first boot the system up. You instead have to unlock it. It even says on the back of the box that you have to beat Stage 1 in the original Star Fox first. It's honestly a weird decision to do that, but I guess Nintendo didn't want people immediately trying out Star Fox 2 without working towards it first. It isn't too much trouble to unlock it at least, I mean Star Fox's first stage isn't that long anyways. Overall, I am still glad that Star Fox 2 was finished and included in here. Just don't expect it as one of the absolute best games the SNES has to offer. So is the SNES Classic worth the $80 price tag? Honestly, it all depends. If you're someone who has played or owned nearly if not every game featured on here, then I don't see a reason to pick one up, even with Star Fox 2 as a bonus. There are ways to add more games via modding, but I am not going to go into that here. A quick Google or YouTube search should point you in the right direction if you are interested. But if you're someone who has never played a majority, if not all of the games on offer here, or if you've just never owned or played an SNES, I'd say it's absolutely worth it. If you can find one, that is. As of this video, it still seems like the SNES Classic is still relatively hard to find. 
Nintendo promises that more will be coming in stock within the next few months, we'll see about that, as well as doing a brand new run of the NES Classic in 2018. Maybe then I'll finally be able to get one and talk about that as well, mainly to see if there are any changes or improvements added to the reprint. So if you are interested in getting one of these and end up finding it in a store for retail price or cheaper, do yourself a favor and pick one up. It's a really well built and convenient mini system with some of the best games ever made included inside. And I mean look at it, the tiny size of this thing is super cute, I love it. Just don't pay more than $80 for it because it's nowhere near worth the absurd scalper prices. Yeah, I've seen them on Amazon. Those prices are freaking ridiculous. Uh, Oni? Yeah? What are you doing here? Well, I heard you were doing a plug and play on the SNES Classic. I was gonna do a plug and play on the SNES Classic. So maybe I thought we could do a collab on it? Well, you're a little late. I was just about to wrap this video up. Oh, really? Oh, man. That's what I get for playing Gundam Versus for too long. Actually, I do have a way to shoehorn your opinion into the end of this video. Oh yeah? What's that? One minute review! Wait, what? Ready, go! Oh crap! Oh crap! Uh, uh, wait! I got it! The SNES Classic is a good deal for $80 despite only having 21 games on it. I wish it had more like Final Fighter Saturday Night Slam Masters in it, but I can take what they got considering Mega Man X is in it. Star Fox 2 is the best selling point since it was never officially released and since I didn't play it on an emulator, this is perfect for me. If you do want it, don't go get it at flipper prices. Get it for $80. It's worth the money and the wait. Wow, good job, Oni. Pro Jared would be proud. Well, I do my best. Now if you don't mind, I really need to finish this video up. Alright, thanks for letting me on. I appreciate it. You know, I actually had an idea of how to end this video before Oni showed up. Now I completely forgot what that was. So instead... Mm, here's that Japanese link to the past commercial. See you next time! Action! Tomato, Kotonaku, no Merikomo! Mochi no Ron, Super Famicom!